Welcome to another edition of ZFF Daily. I'm your host, Ben Lyons, and I'm very happy to be joined in our studio today by one of the many producers of Rush, the president of Cross Creek Pictures, Brian Oliver, is joining us. Congratulations, man, on Thank premiering you. at the Zurich Film Festival. How'd it go for you last night? It was okay? It went great. The other yeah, night, I should the, say. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, the film seemed to be really well received, and Q&A was fun. It was good. Well, uh, what I love about the film festival here is you have a nice mix of films from all over the world, yet there is also a focus on films that are made and take place right here in Switzerland, uh, which is a nice part about this festival. And one of those films in particular is a documentary that's premiering tonight here in Zurich. It's called Neuland, and here's a little bit more from the filmmakers uh, about the project. They arrived in Switzerland by plane, train, bus, and rubber boat from Afghanistan, Cameroon, Serbia, and Venezuela. Each is faced with the same painful question. Is there a place for me in this country? Here at the Kasen in Areal in Basel, an integration class helps young immigrants adjust to Swiss society and prepare for a career. We met their teacher, Mr. Tsing, and filmmaker, Anna Tommen, who followed the students for two years to create her first feature-length documentary film, Neuland. Anna explores different perspectives in Neuland. I think that people who live on the edge of the society have a lot of about the society. I make films about people on the edge of the society, but I always have a look at the society and the with these people. Und ich finde das einfach spannend, weil das immer neue Blicke sind und andere Blicke. Seit mehr als zehn Jahren denke ich immer, man müsste einen Film über so eine Klasse machen. Man müsste mal zeigen, was, da für, was, was, was die Leute für Schwierigkeiten haben. They discover cultural differences that lie at the most fundamental level. Geht aber auch Renz, Renz? Ja, er ist Herr Ali. Ja, er hat zwei Stunden. Herr Ali. Herr, Herr uh, Ali. Alles richtig verstanden? Ali, ja, genau. Ja, da Herr Ali. Ich weiß, bei Ihnen kann ich bei Ihnen eine Schnupperwoche machen, als Gärtner. In order to assimilate, both Swiss culture and behaviors have to be taught. Sie kommen aus ganz anderen Verhaltensnormen. Und da lasse ich Sie auch immer wieder darüber erzählen, wie Sie es machen. Und dann kann ich erzählen, wie, wie es wir hier machen. Und dann kann man schauen, wie man einen Weg von Ihnen zu uns findet. Anna Tommen found a way to get profound insights into the protagonists' lives. Was wichtig ist, ist, dass man von sich auch etwas gibt. Also, dass man nicht einfach so eine so die anonyme Regisseurin ist, die dann innen sitzt und, und man lernt sie gar nicht kennen und dann verschwindet sie wieder, sondern dass man sich auch zeigt. The approach works. The lives on screen feel vivid and real. Others think so as well. Tommen was already given the First Steps Award in Berlin. That's Neuland. Be sure to check it out while it's playing here in Zurich. And I said to you before we saw that piece that you're one of the many producers on Rush. It's a really interesting story on how the whole project came together. And the first independent film for Ron Howard and his career. Talk my audience a little bit through how this, this epic story finally came to the big screen. Uh, well, originally when I got the script, um, it came from CAA and... and um, Paul Greengrass was attached to direct. And we did a series of meetings with Paul, and Paul was very concerned about the budget, and he was very concerned, being a huge Formula One fan, that we would be able to capture the essence of Formula One in the right way. And uh, so when we were doing the budgeting process, it just so happened he got offered the Captain Phillips to direct that movie. and. Uh, and you know he's a super great guy, nice guy. He's like, I love this movie, but I really, I need to go do this. I, you know, it's the movie I've been chasing, and and he was very gracious. And then, uh, so we literally were like, okay, we still want to do the movie. I told Peter, look, I, you know, we really still will finance the movie. Let's go find the right filmmaker. And you know, he said, well, you know, I did Frost Nixon with Ron Howard. What do you think? I'm like, 
I love Ron Howard, you know, and like literally within a day, I think, we met a bunch of other directors just because we had to because it was like the process. But but then I, but Ron's not a Formula One guy, so not Paul, at all. Paul is a all. huge Formula huge One Formula. guy. So that's a that's a big leap of faith for for producers. You have his director who lives and dies with the sport and knows it to a, a, a novice, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, but it's Ron it, Howard, but it's he's still. He but I think it was different than that because I I think the movie has to transcend racing to work. Mm-hmm. So sitting down with Ron, it was a different conversation. It wasn't about the racing, and it wasn't. It was it was. Can we tell the story, you know, well enough? And can we exude these characters? And can we get past, you know, making it more than just a race film? And when you saw, when I sat with with Ron, and he pitched like his take of the movie and what he saw, it you really, you, I knew right then. I'm like, this is the guy. Yeah, this I mean, is the guy. You guys are making the kinds of movies that people in Hollywood don't make anymore. And not only are you making them, but you're making money with them. They're doing well. They're finding audiences mm-hmm. both in the states. And around the world, you look at Ides of March and Black Swan, and these are kind of unconventional projects for the current studio system at play. That seems to be your calling right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, the whole, we set up a film fund and our whole niche and what we were trying to do was find those movies that are in-betweeners. They're not quite a studio film, but they're not a little independent either. And I think that uh, if you look over the last few years, the, you know, The Fighter, Black Swan, um, you know, there's a bunch of those movies that like studios put in turnaround and we picked up and we made. And I feel like 20 years from now, those are the films that people are going to be going back and looking at as sort of the important films of, of this generation, really. If you were making a vault and burying mm-hmm. it somewhere, you'd want those films to be in that, in that collection. So how, where do you look for projects? Are you reading the news? Are you just connecting I mean, now in Hollywood and meeting Yeah, writers? I mean, we, we develop some of the stuff are ourselves, but we also, you know, read every script that goes around. And, you know, there's a lot of material that is, is at studios that they're not going to make. So we kind of go mine their, 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 their slate and find stuff that they're just are really good scripts that they're not making. And we, you know, it makes sense for us to make it at 30. It doesn't make sense for them to make it at 60. Yeah. So it's kind of finding material that we know actors and directors will gravitate to, but yet will want to do it for the belief in the movie, not for a payday. I mean, that's the key. If you're trying to do independent films and you want to pay people their quotes, you can't do it. Yeah, you know? there's no way to get it done. It's not. And, so, and then how does a festival like Zurich come into your world and help your everyday business and, and having your film here? And then I would imagine you're busy meeting with film finance people yeah. and other directors and artists and things. So talk to me a little bit about this festival, which is really new on the scene. And yeah, no, but in the last couple of years, the Zurich Film Festival has kind of just shot up. And it was... Uh, you know, I usually come and speak at their film finance summit. So uh, I've been here for the last four years, and um, and then the movies keep getting bigger and bigger, and the the talent that they're bringing in c- continues to grow. And I just think it's one of those film festivals that like people are talking about, and I think it's going to be end up being one of the major film festivals. What were the films that you grew up watching as a kid that made you fall in love with movies and, and want to get into this business? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I grew up, my favorite movie of all time is The Godfather, and, you know, and then just, just I just always like movies. I like going to the theater and disappearing for two hours. Mm-hmm. You know, your life kind of stops, and you become something else, and you get into this movie, and you can forget about everything else. And then I just remember as a kid, when I was really liking a movie, I'd look at my watch going, oh, my God, it's going to be over soon. I mean, most people, I'm stuck in movies looking at my watch going, when is this gonna, <laughs> When is this thing going to end? But you're like, oh no, there's only 10 minutes left. Yeah. I've never heard that. I love that. What was the first job you had in the business that made you realize you could do this for a living? Uh, after law school, I worked at Paramount. And I was originally going to be a sports agent because I used to play sports. And then uh, I ended up working at Paramount and legal and got put on the film stuff and like just really liked it. And I was yeah. like... Film is way more interesting than sports. Sure. So the, now you have to do both at the same time. Yeah. With Rush. Which yeah, is, exactly. Which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, and I, you know, I was, I wasn't born when, when the whole Nikki Lauda James Hunt thing happened, and and it's fun talking to people who have seen the movie now who remember that time period. How did you discover uh, the story? Had you heard of it before meeting with Paul or, or talking with Peter Morgan? I was not familiar with the story, and that that's a testament to how good Peter Morgan's script was because when I read it it could have been fictional and I still would have liked it you know and the, the fact that that was all true made me go wow that can't be true you know and then you look it up and you're like whoa really he really slept with 90 stewardesses the night before the wow 
he's a wild man. You know, all that stuff just made it made it so colorful that you couldn't believe that all those events were true, and well, they were. The film kicked off this year's Zurich Film Festival, and we had a chance to hang out with some of the stars and, and give you guys a little behind the scenes look at Rush. Rush helped kicked off the opening night of the ninth annual Zurich Film Festival, tells the intense true story of Formula One drivers James Hunt and Nicky Lauda, whose fierce rivalry helped define the sport in the 1970s. Directed by Oscar winner Ron Howard, the film authentically depicts the lives of these two very different champions, Hunt, the carefree playboy, and Lauda, the technical perfectionist. I have the track record here. I'm the only person in history to do the ring in under seven minutes. So actually, it's to my advantage to race it today. Because I'm quicker than all of you. <laughs> Lauda, the Austrian Formula One legend, is played by the German actor Daniel Bruhl, who I spoke with here in Zurich. When you meet Nicky, you have a new appreciation for your performance. And, and talk to me about your first conversations with him. He's an intimidating guy. Yeah, he's, he's uh, terribly blunt. He's probably the most undiplomatic man on earth. And the uh, <laughs> first time he um, he called me, uh, he said, uh, uh, yes, it's Nicky, I guess we have to meet now. And I said, yes, Nicky, that'd be great. And then he said, uh, we'll just bring hand luggage to Vienna in case we don't like each other, you can piss off right away. So that's... Uh, it's pretty. And from there, a beautiful friendship forms after that. That's amazing. Yeah, fortunately. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's got to be uh, nerve-wracking as an actor to have the real-life guy still on. He comes to set a few times, and, and he's there to give, you know, give advice, or as opposed to you know, somebody who's passed away or you don't have that kind of relationship with. The good thing is he was always bored after 10 minutes. So, uh, and shooting is boring, you know, if you don't have anything to do. So after, after yeah, five to 10 minutes, I always said, okay, bad, it's boring, bullshit. Uh, see you next time. <laughs> So, uh, uh, and I, 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 uh, I appreciated that, you know, because I, I, I was nervous when I saw him on set, you know, and me being dressed up as him and having the real guy and then you're acting like him, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit strange. But I, I always wanted to know if he's happy with, uh, with the results, you know. So we always sent him rushes and he, he gave me his feedback and that was pretty... Uh, um, helpful, helpful yeah. yeah. And then switching gears, I just saw you in Fifth Estate opposite Benedict Cumberbatch, and you look completely different than you do in this, and that seems to be a calling card for you nowadays. You enjoy being able to, to change your hair or your accent or a little bit of, right? Is someone we were, we were in here just talking before you came in and said, why well, he looks different in every movie. Mm -hmm. That's something you kind of take pride in as an actor? Yeah, sure. It's, uh, it's, it's a privilege, you know, if, you, if you're offered uh, parts where you can show all these different uh, um, uh, sides. Uh, um, I mean, in this case, uh, it was funny because I played uh, two real characters in a row. So, uh, yeah, Daniel uh, has a beard, glasses, and uh, is a, uh, is computer a, com is a computer guy. guy. And then before that, it, it couldn't have been more different, you know. Uh, uh, Nicky being this uh, Formula One guy from the... Uh, from the 70s, but uh, yeah, it's been it's been great uh, to do both of these movies. Well, I look forward to seeing what you do next. Four interviews for Rush. I think we're done yeah. with Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you, buddy. So when you meet Nicky Lauda and you see him speak, and he's still on television calling mm -hmm. races now, and then you see Daniel Brühl's performance, it's incredible. This guy is new on the scene for American audiences, mm -hmm. but has been working in this part of the world for a long time. Talk to me a little bit about Daniel and, and kind of how refreshing it is to have somebody like that as a part of a movie like Rush. It, I mean, it was like, you know, our, our industry, especially in the independent film sector, is pretty much who's in the movie. You know, if we're gonna go pre-sell a movie, they wanna know like, okay, who's the actor? Not if he's right, not if he's the best actor. Oh, can we sell him? So, going into this movie, you know, we found Chris kind of at the right time, who was like, you know, Thor and yeah. doing really good Avengers, and, and, he, and he actually put himself on tape, and he was right. And the, but there was never ever discussion about Daniel. Daniel was always Lauda. It, it, like he was, we never ever even talked about another actor. But he's not going to help you go sell the movie, really. No, but we just felt like he is such a good actor, and he was he he is Lauda, and like so there was never and Peter Peter coming into it, I think 
had already written the role for him. So yeah. it wasn't, and so, but it, the great thing is, you know, now he's in the WikiLeaks movie, um, and he, I think this is going to be a, a life-changing event for him. I think you, this movie will change his life. You joked last night saying he's going to be in Transformers 5. And six. <laughs> and six. So you got a two-picture yeah. deal already. Two-picture deal. <laughs> it's really, but, you know, you, you walk, as a producer, you walk a dangerous tightrope of having to get a star to go and raise money, mm -hmm. but then maybe it's not the right fit for yeah. the part, so the movie suffers. How do you, how do you balance that? Uh, it, it's a tough thing. You know, I think somewhere down the road, especially with the change with the internet and Twitter, people go see movies because they're good. Uh, for too long, the studio believes that, yo, you need this person to open the movie. And you know what? Nowadays, if the movie's bad, it doesn't open the movie. So hopefully someday down the road, we'll be able to make movies with whoever's right, not whoever can open a movie. Um, you, know, but it, uh, you know, but it also, you know, the way the foreign market is driven, they, they care who's in it, you know? And, 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 it, and so you kind of have to balance the creative process with the monetary you know, benefits of having a movie star. And then you're also balancing having success at the box office with getting critical praise for a project. And we're embarking on the award season now. Mm -hmm. After having gone through Black Swan and see the film get nominated and Natalie win for her role, what did you learn from that whole run with Black Swan that maybe you take to something like Rush or whatever you're working on next? Uh, I learned to pace yourself because <laughs> the award season it, it goes on from now until like March, and like there's something every weekend. And I, you know, I feel really confident that people will be be well received with Rush, and I think we have total potential there. Um, you know, but we didn't. The one thing we don't do is we don't make movies with the intent of oh, this will be an awards movie. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to make good movies, and I think that audiences will gravitate to this, and I think that will help with the, the awards buzz of it. I think it's one of those movies that maybe on its surface, you know, you're like, a racing movie, I, I don't know about that. But if the people who see it, they're like, oh my God, it's so much more than a racing movie. So I think we're gonna heavily rely on the word of mouth and uh, the positive reviews of the movie to try to drive it all the way through. Well, one of my best friends in the world, my college roommate, Adam Kasson, works for your company. So I know how busy he is because I'm always wanting to go watch a basketball game or something. Right. He's like, no, I've got work. So I know you guys have a million things going on, but what can you tell our audience about what you're working on next and what's down the pipeline? Probably our next movie is going to be Beautiful Ruins. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a big book. Um, by, that Jess Walters wrote that Todd Field adapted for us. He's going to direct. Uh, we're starting to cast it. It's, uh, it takes place in Europe. We'll shoot it in Italy. Uh, so it's a very much a European type film. And it, um, it is set during the period when Fox was making Cleopatra and follows Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton's affair and what went down. And From Rush to that, just you're just in the Richard Burton. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it seems yeah. like yeah, Susie we, Miller Richard and Burton's a common theme. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was black. Everything we did was black before we did Black Swan, Woman in Black, Black Mass. <laughs> now it's just Richard this Burton This is the Richard movies. Burton business. Well, Richard Burton has to have some type of thing in every one of our movies. <laughs> well, whatever you're doing, you're doing a wonderful job, man. Thank and, you. And keep up the good work, and congratulations Thank on you. Rush which premiered right here at the Zurich Film Festival opening night and features a great screenplay from writer, uh, two-time Academy Award nominee Peter Morgan, who had a chance to hang out with the ZFF Daily crew. So we are here with Peter Morgan, who is the screenwriter of Rush, and uh, we're in the back of the car talking to one another. And um, uh, the first question I had for you is, were you a Formula One fan or a race fan before this? And what, what drew you to the story? What brought you to the story? I wasn't a Formula One fan, and I'm still not. I think a lot of people had wanted to do Nikki's story before, and it had been very German-centric. And I think as soon as he heard the take that I had and, and, and my angle on the story, I think he, he, he decided to do it. So I, we went for dinner and I told him, you won't like what I do. You have no control, which will be very hard for someone who is such a successful businessman um, and such a control freak because drivers are, you know, they need to be in control. I said, you're going to have to let someone drive you here. And he doesn't let anyone drive him or fly him or anything. And I said, uh, 
uh, those are the terms you know the terms are I pay you nothing you probably won't like it but it I guarantee you I will write your character with respect and integrity even if you find it painful what I say what kind of advice would you give to um, young artists or young you know people who are interested in writing the the art the craft of writing um, what kind of advice would you give them you mean that writing is writing and uh, uh, shooting is shooting I mean I'm sitting here with you in a car with somebody holding a cannon maybe there are two cannons and three and you're just making it this is there there is no what if and what's happens if and the the democratization of of technology now is that there is no excuse people have not got an excuse if they're not out writing you need no money for um, obviously you need to exist but there's no excuse papers cheap computers are cheap cameras are cheap make it and and it doesn't matter if it's five minutes ten minutes 20 minutes there's always a way of releasing it especially now with YouTube uh, it, I, there's no mystery it's practice and uh, and the only kind of people of whom I'm contemptuous are the people who have masterpieces in their head that they don't feel willing to share with the world. Um, it's not easy, and uh, uh, you know you've got to practice. And I have ten, fifteen years of bruises of writing and getting smacked in the face and you've got to get through that. You know, some people are lucky, they're just geniuses from the get-go, but I, I, I wasn't. And um, so I had my years where I had broken noses and broken lips from trying to work and it getting rejected and you just got to keep going. I think that's probably about it. Um, yeah, thanks for being here with us and thanks for coming to the film festival and being a part of the it's celebration. Nice to come to the Zurich Film Festival and not get arrested. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I arrived at the airport and was like, uh-oh. They lock their artists up here. That's right. I want to thank producer Brian Oliver for stopping by this show. Tomorrow on ZFF Daily, Hugh Jackman, the star of Prisoners, right here in Zurich, as well as one of the more talked about filmmakers at this year's festival, Ryan Coogler, the director of Fruitvale Station in our studio. On behalf of everyone here at ZFF Daily, thanks for watching. Let's have a look at the green carpet of Friday, 27th of September. The highlights. We made the film, we made it with a very small budget, with very little time. We had very talented people involved, but it was my first time ever making a film. Look, I'm from the generation who saw the man stepping in the moon for the first time live on TV. Thomas Müller is the most common name in Germany.